Okay, I want to tell you a story about an epic run, uh, an experience that I've had. Day three in the Manaslu Trail Race. This is nine days through the Himalayas. Day three, we climbed up the trails up to about 4,000 meters, that's about 13,000 feet. And then we just ran on a flat plain, it's just sort of a tundra plain for about five kilometers to a monastery where there was an aid station, which was our, our one stop for the day. At 4,000 feet, the air was thin. And because we'd done a lot of climbing, we were pretty gassed and gasping. The air was also very, very clear. And the terrain was perfectly flat. But when we got to the checkpoint, we went into sort of a, a canyon and there was nobody there apart from a couple of runners. But I was just looking around and everywhere I looked, in every direction, there are just these huge, huge white mountains everywhere. All the mountains around us were 6,000 meters, 7,000 meters tall. So although we were at 4,000 meters, right at the sort of right at the top of the Colorado Rockies type of height, um, it felt like we were just on the flat and the, all the Rockies were in front of us because the Himalayas are such big mountains. And it's difficult to kind of describe it in words. You really, it's one of these things that you have to be there. But just looking around, it was just so majestic. And I was probably so oxygen deprived. I was absolutely moved to tears just by the sight of the huge mountains everywhere. I took a little video, in fact, on my phone. I was looking at it the other day and the word I used to describe the situation while I was looking around was gobsmacked. I don't know if you know the word gobsmacked. It's a sort of English slang word. Uh, and I looked it up in the Urban Dictionary and it says it means astounded with wonder, which I think really sums it up. The word I was basically looking for was epic. And that brings us to today's book, which is called Epic Runs of the World by Lonely Planet. Welcome to Running Book Reviews Podcast. This is where we, we review the running books to help you decide if you'd like to read the books for yourself. And where we review the books so we can have a jolly good chat about the stuff we love and you can listen to us doing it. And hopefully you'll love it too. We think this kind of talk keeps you motivated about your own running. And we hope it'll inspire you to try something new or look at something new or maybe buy the book for yourself. My name's Alan and with my co-host Liz. I'm going to talk to you today about a bit of a different book called Epic Runs of the World by Lonely Planet. This book is a is more of a coffee table book. It's a hardcover featuring special places to run and running events from all over the world with lots of pictures. The runs are organized by continent, starting with Africa and followed by the Americas, Asia, Europe, and Oceania. There are the main runs listed in the table of contents, and each one is then followed by three other more like this runs, which feature less detailed explanation and no pictures. The main runs each have descriptions and pictures over several pages and include other useful information like where to stay and what to wear. Um, each race is authored by a different person. So for this book, there's no author. It's put together by Lonely Planet. So the book is, um, is a compilation of different running destinations from different authors. The publisher, Lonely Planet, has a travel information website and has a lot of other travel books available. We're not traveling at the moment, but uh, the website can be a great resource for planning. And they, they're already in 2021 mode. About getting a bit of a flavor to go traveling again. Exactly. Yeah. You, can, uh, you can start planning for your next races. So since the book had no single author, we thought we would take a slightly different approach. And we contacted a few of our running friends who have done some of the runs in the book. Uh, we asked them to tell us about the runs and the experience they had firsthand. So before we start with our guests, uh, we've picked uh, each a run that kind of stuck out for us in the book. And uh, maybe, Alan, you can, you can start with uh, the one that you kind of were eyeing. 
Yeah, Liz, you asked me to 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 give you a kind of an epic run of choice from the from the book. Well, there's so many epic runs in the book. You kind of go through the book and go, well, I'd like to do that. Oh, oh I'd like to do that too. Oh, oh, there's one that I'd like. So it's kind of impossible really to choose. It it's a bit of a problem. What, it kind of depends what you're looking for. The one I chose is the thing I've been looking at the most closely for some, kind of one of the next uh, adventures that I want to do. I think it's on page 136 in the book. And it's called the Grand Canyon's Rim to Rim Challenge. In North America, I think uh, it, it almost speaks for itself. I mean, the Grand Canyon's a natural wonder of the world. I love the mountains and uh, the mountain views and the canyons, basically awesome. The Rim to Rim to Rim, so crossing the canyon and going back again. I think it's 42 miles, but it's extremely tough because it has 6,400 meters of vert. And, and often a huge temperature variation. So it can get quite cold because uh, you've got to start in the middle of the night or in the dark. Um, and it can get extremely hot in the, the middle of the canyon. I think if, if I was to do it, um, rather than get up really, really early and run hard and get to one end and run back, I think I would stay overnight at one end and then run back and take two days to sort of drink in all the experience, take some photographs, sit around, I would have to go with friends. Yep. And um, actually, you've already recruited some. because yes, I've got people on standby. <laughs> I, I don't know what you guys are doing, you and Andre are doing, but... Uh, well, I think Andre, Andre is very much, um, he's on board. Got to be in for that. Yeah, he's yeah. definitely in for that. So for sure, you got to do it with friends so that you can relive it regularly afterwards which is what epic runs are about as far as i'm concerned although katie arnold did it by herself and she talks about that in her book yeah i think a, a different different strokes for different folks and different types i mean if you're going from a, a meditative experience or a, some sort of spiritual type experience but if you're going for a social and to be able to mm -hmm. share it afterwards i think i'd like to do it with other people there, there are many, many other runs in the book I'd like to do for more cultural reasons, to go to different, ex more exotic places, I think. And certainly uh, one place that I have been that I've just described is, is Nepal in the Himalayas. And, and that's certainly somewhere where I'd love to go back to just because of the, the cultural, the atmosphere, the people. Um, everyone says, you know, you go to Nepal for the mountains, but you go again for the people. And I think it's probably true. Um, that's something I'd like to do again before uh, before I hang up my running shoes. So what about you? What did you see in the book that uh, you thought was interesting that you thought, ooh, I'd like to do that? Okay, so I saw this one race. It's on page 208. Um, it's called an Ode to a Czech Running Hero. And so before I say uh, anything about the race, so um, the, the race was set up in a Czech industrial town by um, Emil Zatopek's wife, Dana, so Emil Zatopek is like a Czech kind of running hero and he's he's the real running hero in the Czech Republic, but um, he won gold in the 5K, 10K and marathon at the um, 1952 Olympic. And all those races were within eight days and that has never been reproduced. Like no other runner has ever done that. He was sort of uh, strange. He has a bit of a reputation to be a strange kind of character he really liked to hurt yeah isn't he sort of an absolute badass yeah he is yeah. he would do things like he would go for long runs in his army boots and things like that so he's uh, got a bit of a reputation and the entry in the book is actually written by a guy named Richard Asquith but he um, he wrote a book all about Emil Zatopek called Today We Die a Little. And it's been in my Amazon cart for a long time, actually. <laughs> I've been kind of eyeing that book. So um, maybe one of these days I'll get to reading it. But anyway, so back to the race. The race is um, set up in a little industrial town. And the town, so the way that it's described is that it looks like nothing, but the people apparently are super friendly. And um, the, the writer said that, you know, he'll go back. He goes back every year, but he says it's one of those races you want to go back but at first it looks like 
not much of a place to visit. And it's uh, the race was started by Emil Zatopic's wife, Dana, two years after his death in the year 2000. Apparently, Emil Zatopic is actually buried uh, near the finish line of the race. So it's a bit like an ode to him. It's a, it's a strange distance. It's 13.86 miles, so 22.3 kilometers. Emil Zatopic is somebody that my dad used to talk about all the time when I was a kid. And I would just, you know, I was 14. All I cared about was running. Um, I actually didn't care about running history or like I wasn't, I wasn't into actually the sport itself. I was into getting better as a runner, kind of more or less paid attention to the stories uh, it was only later that I found out that he was such a hero and that he he did such a great thing. I guess that's why I kind of I'm kind of curious by this race. Uh, my my dad um, he used to train with a group and it was the same group that uh, Emin Zatopic used to train with apparently. So that's what he used to tell me when when I was a kid. Oh, well, that's fantastic! It's good. It's a nice little connection. Yeah, so that's uh, that's sort of what uh, what I would pick. I mean, of course, I'd, there are a whole bunch of other races in there. I guess uh, that one kind of sparked my interest. Yeah, it's pretty difficult to just pick one. That it is. So let's go and contact some of our friends and get them to tell us about some of the epic runs that they've done that appear in this book. How about that? I think that sounds like a great idea. Okay, let's go. So one of the races in um, Epic Runs of the World uh, on page 64 is the Barkley Marathons. So the Barkley Marathons has the slogan, the race that eats its young. It really is epic. And we actually have somebody that can tell us all about it because he's done the, um, the other races that are like this, which are um, included after the blurb about the Barkley Marathon, and that's the Barkley Fall Classic. So today we have Pete with us, and Pete can take it, tell us all about this. So Pete, what made you decide to do the Barkley Fall Classic, and how did you find out about the race? Well, uh, thank you for inviting me, first of all. The um, Barkley Fall Classic which is the what we call the, the baby Barkley because it's a it's a smaller version of the Barkley marathons and Barkley marathons being the uh, one of the probably one of the toughest hundred milers in the world uh, it's a trail run and this is the baby Barkley it's 50 kilometers roughly we don't really know because you're not allowed a, a GPS uh, a watch so you can't actually know exactly how far you've run but it's it's roughly 50k the way i found out about uh the barkley marathons actually uh, alan miller is the one that told told me about the barkley marathons years ago all his fault yours truly yeah during a long run with a friend of mine anatoly who is a trail runner and uh, we found out about the barkley marathons on our long run and uh, we uh, investigated over time and uh, this is how I ended up. My friend Anatoly actually was the first one to go. He's gone five times since. And in 2017, he, uh, uh, he ran 216. And then that, I, I sort of thought, wow, that's really quite something that he can do this. I wonder if I can do it. And I was actually, so I registered and I was accepted. And there's a wait list. There's a lot of people that want to do this race. And unlike the Barkley Marathons where you have to apply and they only take 40 runners every year, the uh, BFC, as it's called, is open to everybody. And they take about 400 runners. So it ends up, uh, it's become very popular and there's a wait list. And wow. you end up, yeah. So I was lucky the first year I, was, I went in and I was accepted. And uh, so that was in 2017, and that's when I did my first uh, Barclay Fall Classic. So the Barclay Fall Classic, um, is it across really tough terrain, like just like the Barclay Marathons is, in terms of yes. being like ridiculously challenging? It it is, it is. And Alan, you've done you've done some trail running, and you've done some 50ks. Uh, I would say. I always say when I try to describe to people how uh, how hard this race is over 50 kilometers, people have done that have done that distance in a trail run. Uh, if I'll do like a, a 50k normal kind of 50k 
trail race will take me between five and six hours. Uh, this 50K took me over 11 hours, so double the time. So wow. it's a it's wow. really, really hard race. The uh, it, You're actually running, uh, much of it is run on the same trails and terrain as the big Barclay. So uh, there are things that if people have read about the Barclay uh, marathons, there is a famous uh, rat jog, which is one of the really tough hills to, to climb up and down we go up uh, that that same uh, that same hill it's about gosh it's over two kilometers long going up this uh, this hill i've seen a film on uh, on netflix barclay marathons the race that eats its young yeah and um the guys get all cut and slashed because they have to run through um briars and exactly grass. So did you have to do that Yes, we did that, and uh, actually, uh, yeah, and it's, <laughs> uh, I, I, I've done the race twice, so I went in 217, I went back last year in 219, um, in 2019, not 220, and uh, I particularly got, my, my legs got slashed up pretty bad that year, and yes, you go up, basically, it's when you're going up Radjaw, uh, you have these six to seven feet high uh briars and they're sort of like thorns that you would have on a for roses but they're about half an inch long and they are razor sharp so you basically are going to you wear gloves some people you know you you try and have some protective gear but um i purposely that year did not wear anything on my legs you're wearing shorts and i didn't have any kind of leg coverings on my calves i ended up finishing that the race with my legs slashed up like crazy and it's sort of like a badge of honor in a certain way people oh, will boy. actually post their legs with their medal at the end it's it's a thing it's <laughs> it's a thing and then you you take a photo of your legs and then you post that on facebook and everybody goes oh my god so, so definitely like your wife was probably not happy but definitely an epic race right it is it's an epic race it's a it it's not for everybody. First of all, you have to be able to do it and uh, you have cut off points. So uh, to be able to finish it and ultimately when you finish it, what you get at the end of the race is what they call the Croix de Bac. So it's a medal, it sort of looks like an army medal. It's a really, really nice medal which has the effigy of uh, Lazarus Lake who's the founder of the race and he has his face on the medal and to be able to get that medal you have to get to the finish line and it's a hard job and you can get cut off uh, uh, several points during the race if you're not making good time then you'll you'll be cut off and you you're not allowed to finish so um the Barkley marathon actually prides itself on um, having the fewest finishers because some years nobody even finishes the race. What yeah. is, how does that uh, Barkley Fall Classic compare? The year that I finished, I, I've done it twice and I, I was able to get to the finish line in, two, in the first year that I did it. I finished 37th out of 400 runners and there were about 175 people that finished. So, you know, a little over, uh, you know, between a quarter and a third of the people that were able to, to finish. So it's, it's certainly not as difficult. There's nowhere near as difficult as, as the Barclay Marathons. And even one BFC is probably not as hard as one of the loops of the actual Barclay. Wow. Yeah, so it's it's tremendous. the The Barclay Marathons is 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 unreal, but this is hard. You know, it's uh, as a fifty k, uh, and uh, it's it's a really hard race. And when you're able to finish, you can you can be proud of yourself for sure. What would you tell somebody who might be thinking of trying to get in for the Barclay Fall Classic? What advice would you give them? Don't do it. Run away. Well, you have <laughs> to train for it. I mean, I'll tell you, I. I have seen all kinds of people uh, because it's open to everybody. It's there, there's a there's a mystique around the race. So a lot of people just want to go there, and they know they're going to die after one, two, or three hours. 
in the race. They just know. You see them at the start line. You go, oh, my God, what's this guy or what's this girl doing here? They, they're there for the show. They're there because they can see Lazarus, and they've seen it on Netflix and all of that. And they, they know they won't finish. That's one thing. If you're serious about it and you want to go there and finish, well, you have to train for it. And the training is, uh, you have to, to put in some months of, uh, of good trail training, uh, a, a lot of very technical runs. And uh, you, you and I, Alan, have done the Pemi Loop together in the, in the White Mountains. Yeah. Uh, generally, when I've done the, the BFC, I have done at least one Pemi Loop as a training run. And that's a hard 50K. That's a 50K it. mountain ridge run. Yeah. So, you know, that kind of thing. And, and then after that, once you're there, it's uh, just, uh, just trying to, to make it through. And, uh, but, but it's, you, you'll go to, it's probably one of the toughest races that I've done the, the year that I did it. And I've done all kinds of different races like you, you know, and marathons and a uh, hundred milers. It's, uh, it's one of the toughest ones where you have to really dig deep <laughs> uh, to finish. So now that you know what to expect, do you have any plans of going back? Uh, I'm actually scheduled to go back this year in 2021. Oh, so, so I guess it wasn't that bad. Yeah, I applied. No, it is that bad, but you just okay. want to go back. And I, I'm going, it's redemption time because uh, in 2019, I actually didn't finish. And, but I tried and I, I miscalculated the last cutoff and I missed it by two minutes. So oh, no. I, was, I was pulled out of the race, unfortunately. Would I have finished it? I don't know, but I think I might have. So now I want to go back and I'd like to be able to, to have my revenge. And it's okay. just, uh, I figure I, I don't have many of these at 61 and next March, I don't have many uh, chances to go and do these kinds of things. So I'd like to do at least once more. So uh, next September, if all goes well. Okay. Would you ever go um, to try the, the actual Barkley? Well, for sure. It'd be fun to try and go and do one loop. I don't think I would be able to do more than one. And okay. I don't even know if I'd be able to finish one. It's a deal. You have to get in. You have to write a letter. Uh, and you have to be selected. Once you've done the BFC, it sort of gives you a bit of an advantage. You get to know Lazarus and uh, it, it can help. And uh, the year that I did it in 217, actually, I was the first one of two uh, Quebecers. We were the first two Quebecers uh, to do the race and to finish it, Mario Villemur and myself. So we were the first two Quebecers to, to do it. And there was a, an article that was written. They had interviewed Lazarus. And he had sort of maybe jokingly had, had said that we had done very well and that uh, we would be good candidates for the big one. So oh, you never know. You never okay. know. Never say never. Never say never. It'd be fun just to, just to go. I'll show you this on the video just so that you can see. But this is a license plate that I have. Mm -hmm. And if I ever go to the uh, Big Barkley, this is a license plate that I will give to Lazarus because that's what you have to, uh, this is your opening fee. Out of rate. your entry oh. fee, you have to take your a license Your entry fee plate. is a license plate from where you come and a pack of cigarettes. And I think a, maybe a couple of bucks or something like that. It's ridiculous. Yeah, that's actually, I was kind of curious about that because I did hear about that uh, entry fee uh, for, exactly. the, for the Barclay. But what about the uh, BFC? Was Did you have to... No, that one is like a normal race. Uh, you know, it's, it's, I don't know, it's about $150 entry fee. And uh, as I say, it's, it's open to everybody. So then you just, you apply and then you get onto a waiting list uh, and you hope to be selected because there's thousands of people that apply and they take only 400 or so. So, Well, Pete, we hope, uh, well, first of all, we hope the race is on this year and then yeah. we hope uh, you get the redemption that you're looking for, that you uh, succeed in your efforts. You'll need to do some, a little bit of extra training. I think what you need to do is to get somebody who's right-handed to blindfold themselves and then put a razor in their left hand and try and shave your legs. Um, <laughs> that way, <laughs> that way you'll be fully trained with respect to the brambles. Yeah. So that, that would be, that would be pretty unique training. 
yeah, I'll take that uh, uh, as a good advice. Thanks. Okay, cheers, mate. Thank you very much. All the best. Okay, bye bye. I can't believe that race is so intense. <laughs>So one of the runs that uh, we have in the book is called A Quiet Run in Rome, about two thirds of the way through the book. We actually have a friend of ours who's run, not necessarily quietly in Rome, but has run the Rome Marathon. So we thought we'd get Julia on to, uh, to tell us about her experience. So Julia, what inspired you to do the marathon in Rome? Well, um, it was perfect timing that uh, my in-laws had a house in Sicily for the month of April uh, that year, which was 2018. So it worked out very nicely to fly into Rome and be able to do the marathon um, at the beginning of the trip and then have the, you know, the, the balance of the trip to rest and to, to just sort of enjoy southern, southern Italy. What can I say? I mean, just to sort of hear those two words, Rome Marathon, together, it, it, you know, it was it was hard not to to resist looking into it and and sort of figuring it out uh, to make it work because it just seemed to me that in many ways that's you know where a lot of all this athleticism began and the idea of just running on these historic paths and streets and cobblestones. Um, it was epic. I mean, it was really sort of a once, uh, maybe maybe twice in a lifetime event, but uh, who knows what, what the future will bring for sure. It, it felt very, very special to be there. Before we get to if it lived up to its hype, uh, was it really easy to get in? Like, because it sounds like you sort of, uh, you sort of signed up last minute. So how was that process? Uh, it was very straightforward. You did have to have a medical certificate, a stamped medical certificate stating that you know you were in good enough health I guess to run to run this marathon out, out as being a, a Canadian citizen and not not being a, a European person so that was there was some paperwork involved but um, there was no qualifying times that was another reason why it just seemed right um, it has I can't remember offhand the number of participants but it's a big run so um, they were taking applications, you know, within the few months lead up. It wasn't uh, wasn't difficult. What were the most memorable things, the things that you remember, the things that struck you? Well, I certainly remember the start line um, simply because it was extremely warm. And in fact, for the rest of the trip, it was never that warm again. <laughs> but Oh, well, that's disappointing. For that, re for that weekend, for that first two days, um, unseasonably warm temperatures in uh, the first weekend of April in Rome. And I remember thinking, wow, it's getting very hot and we didn't start until nine o'clock. So it meant that really that sort of last um, hour of the race was between noon and one o'clock in um, the sort of unforgiving Roman sun. So it was, it was definitely a warm race. And there were a lot of people uh, who were um, not coping well with the heat and the, the sun exposure. So it certainly felt good to finish. I do remember finishing it and, um, and running it pretty slowly at a certain point because of the heat, I just let go of my time. And I thought I just have to take in the scenery. I'm never gonna run a race that looks like this again, not, not um, anytime soon. So, so it actually was not a bad thing. I think the, the temperatures just slowed people down and allowed, uh, allowed you to sort of take in what you were running through. Do you go past a lot of iconic uh, type things or is Rome itself just iconic all the way through? It's pretty iconic all the way through. And there's these water ducks. I mean, the aqueduct system that it's just, you know, it's thousands of years old. So it's incredible to see. You run past the Vatican. Um, so you wave and uh, no one waves back. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's, you know, it's not a Boston qualifier. It's not a closed course. So you have people with suitcases sort of stepping in front of you with a little dog and it, it becomes kind of, I didn't realize until sort of after it was over that it's, I know, I'm not sure it's taken that seriously by, okay. by, the, by the running community. I mean, there's all these people that dress up as gladiators and there's, you know, there's sort of a, you know, a joie de vivre. I mean, it's, it's not easy. There's definitely hills and those cobblestones are, those are memorable because it's like running on metal plates. That's kind of what it feels like for seven out of the 42 kilometers. So it's not easy, but that being said, it's, you know, there was sort of a lightness to it. 
Well, basically, if once you got over the fact that you're not going to run a PB, which I guess like you were sort of hoping for or hoping for a certain time, if not a personal best, you were hoping for a certain time. But once you got over that, the 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 final verdict on did it live up to the hype? Would you say yes or? I would do it again. Absolutely. I would, you know, I'd be more prepared for, um, it was the heat and also the sun exposure. There's no shade. I mean, Rome, it's, you know, it's an ancient city, so there's nothing over a few stories high and there seem to me very few trees and that kind of thing. You're really running in the city. Um, so there's just an incredible amount of, of, uh, sun. If you're not used to Mediterranean sun, it was a, just a, an incredible, um, sort of way to see Rome. And because we weren't staying there more than a few days, you know, I think I felt I saw more of Rome than, than my family, that's for sure, in, in a nice way. And and there's, you know, um, an allowance to see other famous sites, the, the Spanish Steps, and you end up back at the Colosseum as well. So it's, it's you know, it's, it's pretty impressive to kind of run in with that in, in view at 42.2. At Do you have any um, tips that if people thought, hmm, that could be for me? Any tips for people, do's or don'ts? And how hard was it also, um, uh, like along the same lines, to get that medical clearance? Because that's something like in Canada, we never need that for a marathon. It wasn't hard for me because I work in a hospital, so I just asked a friend, a colleague, to do it. Um, and it's really, it, he just stamped it. Um, there was, I think it's one question, is this person fit to run a marathon? And it's a yes or no. <laughs> so, so that didn't seem too hard to me. It was a bit nerve wracking um, with the correspondence because although it was in English, as I recall, it was clearly not the, the first language of the organizers. And there, there was, um, there were some moments I didn't, I didn't feel a hundred percent sure of it until I had that, that time chip uh, in my hand the day before. And it, it was a bit stressful landing on a Saturday morning coming in from Canada and running the, the marathon on the sun 24 hours later. I, I wouldn't do that again. Yikes. Uh, simply with the jet lag and yeah. So the, just acclimatizing to the, the warm temperatures, but, but at the same time, you know, it was a good, it was a great way to kick off a trip. I can tell you uh, the, the piece that meant the most to me, and it was a complete fluke in that uh, it wasn't planned. And it was actually the, the product of my, my own um, disorganization and, and my husband's as well because his cell phone died, the battery died somewhere uh, during the marathon. And although I saw him and my daughter uh, towards the finish line, we didn't exactly have a meeting place figured out. Um, and whatever we thought we had figured out didn't, didn't work, not with, not with the security. Um, so for the Rome Marathon, their idea of security are like, you know, tanks basically and the army. Um, so <laughs> there were um, soldiers with AK-47s and um, not, not having any English to speak, you know, they, they did not understand English. So there was, there was definitely uh, a period after the race where I could not, I could not get in touch with, with my family. That was, it was a bit stressful, it went on for almost two hours before we were able to finally connect and find each other. What that meant was that when we met up, we actually witnessed the end of the marathon, which is something that I have never seen um, at a big race. Everybody goes to see the beginning, but you don't see the end. Um, so the Italians do this up very nicely and there, there was sort of a song and there was music and you watch the final runners come in over the finish line. And this would have been at that point, well over seven hours since the start time. So who were the final runners? Um, they were the people pushing wheelchairs. And so there was probably maybe 20, 25. They had been pushing these wheelchairs for 42 kilometers. And over the seven same- Seven hours. So the pacer, um, there were a couple of pacers, but the one that stood out to me, he had the, the bubble kind of off his shoulder and it said seven, seven point, uh, seven and a half, seven and a half hours. And, and they came in and the, you know, just the, the look of joy on the faces of the people in the wheelchairs who were clearly people with, with MS, with, with various disorders, they, they can't walk, let alone run, um, crossing that line. And then the pacer actually sort of stepped out in front of me and his wife, I think, 
her girlfriend came came out of the crowd and she she put her arms around him and she said uh, ti amo ti amo and it was like just it was so well it was like i'm getting emotional talking but it was so so meaningful to really sort of see and witness that piece um and i was so glad that my daughter was there and you know like really that's that's what running and racing is all about is is just crossing that line that was a privilege that was an absolute privilege um to to be a part of that ending of it and um you know whatever my time was and all my uh scrapes and sunburn and went out the window because i just think that was really uh a, an amazing moment yeah, that that part i'll never forget fantastic little story mm-hmm. so We decided to interview one of our friends who's done the Boston Marathon. And the reason why we decided to interview him was because when he did the Boston Marathon, it was the very first time. And the Boston Marathon is one of these epic road races. It's um, known as the oldest, oldest marathon in North America. Everybody strives to do this. Like you'll have first time marathoners that just find out about Boston and all of a sudden they're like, oh, wow, that sounds amazing. Like, how do I, uh, how do I qualify for this? Paul was one of these people and he, it took him a little bit of time to qualify, but when he finally did qualify, he got to go. And so he'll tell us if he found that the experience was um, worth all the hype. Let's go and listen to Paul. Okay, well, I uh, did my first Boston Marathon in 2017. Uh, It was the 121st uh, running of the Boston Marathon. Uh, Why did I want to do Boston? Well, on a personal level, it was about accomplishment. I had been running for a number of years, and uh, I had done a a few marathons and was looking to do something, uh, I guess, a little more Uh, on a grand scale and of course uh, running with the Phoenix Running Club there's lots of talk about uh, Boston and and other marathons as well but Boston is fairly um, accessible because it's uh, within a you know five hour or so drive from where we live in Montreal with the training plan that we have with our running club um, it it certainly gives us the opportunity to get ready to do an event like that so for me um, going to Boston obviously started several years before I went to the race, um, but it started seriously about two years before. I think in, in, in the spring of 2017, um, when I joined Phoenix, the inspiration and the motivation started to uh, come together. And the training, of course, was much more structured. You have to qualify to get into Boston, Paul. So did you have the qualifying time sort of in the bag? No, no, no. I wasn't even close at, at that time. Uh, so you're right. You have to qualify for Boston, which is one of the things that makes it fairly unique. I uh, I had done at that point. I had done, I think, two marathons in my life, and and neither of them were anywhere close to a Boston qualifying time. Uh, so uh, the race that I qualified for Boston was in the fall of 2015. It was at the Corning Marathon um, in, in Corning. Actually, it's called the Wine Glass Marathon. It's in Corning, New York. Uh, that, that explains why you were interested in running it, if it's called the Wine Glass Marathon. <laughs> <laughs> well, it certainly didn't hurt. The Wine Glass Marathon is interesting because it's a... Um, an overall d- a downhill course. Uh, it's a very fast course. Um, a lot of people use that for, for qualifying for Boston. So the timing was pretty good for me that fall. And, uh, you know, I had an objective of running the course. I had set a realistic objective depending on the weather and, and, and whatever happens on the day. But then I had a stretch objective as well. And my stretch objective was the Boston qualification. So uh, I had put in a lot of training, um, was very focused on discipline, um, following the plans, read a couple of books to kind of get um, not only physically prepared, but mentally prepared. And uh, I think um, when we got to Corning that year, 
the stars were aligned because the weather was good. I was feeling great the morning of the race. I would have been happy to make, you know, my goal time for that day. But fortunately, I was able to get my first BQ. And um, it was uh, it was an unbelievable experience. Um, and of course, I, you know, I had friends around from the Phoenix Running Club. So that made it that much sweeter. Yeah, that always helps when there's people you know cheering for you. Well, cheering cheering for me, uh, yeah, but then, you know, after the race, you're able to, to celebrate with your friends and um, really feel the uh, elation of having done something, not just meeting your goal, but but going, you know, beyond that and um, and getting to that objective that was maybe only a dream. And, and you know that they know what it means to you, you know, because they're not just people saying, oh, yes, how nice. They know what it means to qualify for Boston when you're uh, you have an ambition to do it, and it's not at all. Uh, yeah, that's it's so true because you know many many of the many of the people that I shared that moment with have been to Boston, so they they appreciate um, what what it's about. And I guess there are a lot of people also uh, in our club that you know they've been wanting to qualify and they've been trying for a long time, and they just they just never they just never get the qualifying time after all this so the the journey to qualify for boston is you know only half of it once you actually get to boston so what was that like you had to register i think the registration opens pretty early so it opens in september right so maybe you can kind of describe what that's like and then um and then also the magic of getting to boston yeah so my qualifying run was um, 18 months before the actual marathon in Boston. Uh, so when I had uh, registered in, um, uh, I think it was September of 2016, um, of course, you don't know if you're going to make the cut because um, I had about a three minute buffer better than my BQ, but it was, uh, it was, a uh, it was enough. And then I got my confirmation that I was um, invited to the Boston Marathon. Uh, so that was another big thrill. Um, and then of course, then there, you've got to train for, you know, four or five months um, before the race itself. So for us, that means training in the winter. Uh, and I remember that that was a pretty cold, pretty cold winter, pretty cold spring even. Um, but, um, you know, finally, uh, the day comes when you you have to go to Boston and I had uh, gone down with uh, three other guys from Montreal and uh, two of two of them from our club and uh, we stayed in we stayed in a hotel in uh, in Waltham so we get to Boston and uh, we go down to the expo which was a, a pretty exciting thing in its own uh, in its own right um, go get our, our race pack and pick up our um, our kit uh, and then go through the expo and I remember I was there I said I'm here now I don't know if I'm going to get back or, or when I'm going to get back so I bought a whole bunch of stuff I bought you know <laughs> I bought the race jacket and it was a pretty nice race jacket that year it was it was white and blue um, oh you were lucky because the year that I did it I only did it once in 2011 and it was black and green it wasn't even the Boston colors yeah, they they I, I, they had some odd colors in some years, but um, it was a good color in 2017. Um, of year. course, you get your race your race jersey. It was it was the yellow jersey with the blue trim. Um, I got uh, I got a beard glass. I got a coffee mug. I got I think I even yes I got a hoodie with with you know BAA embroidered on the front. So I said, look, I, I, I you know you got to get it while you're here because you've only got one chance. And and if you come back, well then that's you know that's icing on the cake. The race organizers love you, Paul. <laughs> they, they yes, they did. <laughs> Um, uh, so we did that, and then after the expo, we did a little walkabout on Boylston Street and checked out the uh, the finish line. We bumped into a few other friendly faces from Montreal, and we went and had dinner in, in Boston. I'm pretty sure we had pasta that night, and then the next day was a rest day, uh, and um, uh, I think we took it pretty easy. Once again, you know, carb loading the night before, I think, and then uh, the day of the race, the morning of the race, well, we're up super early, and uh, we have to make our way to uh, Boston Common to get on the school buses that take us to the Athlete Village. And how early, how early did you have to get to the Athlete Village? Uh, well, I was going with um, the three other guys that I was traveling with were in um, faster corrals or faster waves than I was. So um, I, we needed to be there fairly early. I, I think we left the hotel at 
5 a.m. or something Yeah, I think like you have that. to get on the buses for Wave 1 at like 6 a.m. or 6.30 a.m. latest. It was something like that. But the race only starts like at 10, I think. Is that right? Uh, I think it's even later than that. I think um, it might even be 11 a.m. for the... Uh, the first uh, amateur wave because they have, as you know, they have the elites, but then they also have the uh, wheelchair racers and the push racers and and the others that go earlier. So, you, you know, you get to the village and then you do have a wait. And so in our case, um, it was a fairly cool morning, um, but dry. It was a little hard to stay warm because uh, uh, in Boston, you, you can't take um, a, a bag and check it and then get it back after. Anything that you take to the athlete village stays at the athlete village and, and you don't get it back. So you either take something really old that you don't mind leaving uh, if, you, if you need to stay warm and stay dry. But um, that day it wasn't, it was dry, but uh, it, a little bit on the cool side at, at 6 or 7 a.m. So then we, uh, you know, you line up for bathrooms and things like that. Um, and then the, the other guys had to go and take their start. Um, my start, I was in wave three I don't remember the corral exactly, but I had to wait around for a little bit. And then, uh, so finally we get going. And the the start in Boston, as you can imagine, is uh, a lot of people that are um, getting ready to, to race and all at, uh, at the starting gun. So the, the start I remember quite clearly was like, a, a it was very crowded um, and you start moving very slowly. You start at a, you know, a bit of a very slow jog. And then the narrow roads going out of Hopkinton is like a funnel. So you, you're going a lot slower than you really want to be going. And then after you get out maybe a mile, a mile and a half, well, the crowd starts to thin a little bit and then you can sort of spread out and, and maybe get a little bit closer to your pace. I felt that once I did get to that point, I was able to go uh, pretty much at the pace that I wanted to. And, and I think I was probably going a little too quick. Did you actually have a goal, like a goal pace for the Boston Marathon to run during? Yeah, I wanted to break four hours in the marathon itself. Uh, okay. I, I wasn't I wasn't looking to have a, any kind of record time during during the the marathon itself. But my goal pace was to try and come in under four hours. Um, I ended up finishing just over four hours, uh, and uh, I think part of that was um, part of that had to do with um, the weather. So we trained in in very cold weather. Uh, just before, you know, the third Monday in April um, here in, in Montreal. And the high that day in, in Boston was 21 degrees. So, mm -hmm. you know, training in single digit weather and then doing a marathon at 21 degrees, um, it was yeah. a little bit tough. Because I think I was in, I think I was well trained. And the course, I, I didn't feel the course to be particularly daunting. Uh, the guys that I had gone down with and, and, and even before I, I had gone down, you know, Pierre and, and Nestor and, and, and others um, were able to relate their experience and, and kind of allay the fear that some people may have about things like um, Heartbreak Hill. Um, I remember getting to Heartbreak Hill and getting over it and go, well, that wasn't so bad. Um, yeah. But then, you know, then you've got to finish the race and you're starting to feel like you're going to hit the wall. Um, and um, it was, um, you know, it was it was punishing. Um, but then uh, I distinctly remember getting to, uh, you know, landmarks like the sit-go sign. And then, you know, you're getting closer to the finish. You come around a corner onto Boylston Street and then there's these huge crowds. And there's if there's anything that, that Boston is famous for and, and, and is, is exceptional for, it's the crowds and the cheering. Would you say that's the memorable part or were there other yeah, the Boston Street finish. Well, it, it's it's definitely you know the crowds and the cheering and the support all along the way is 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 very unique. I, I've never done any other race where you have so much support from you know people on the sidelines. But when you come into onto Boylston and you've got a few hundred meters to go, it literally felt to me like you know you're running into uh, at the finish of, of of an Olympic event. That's that's the kind of feeling. That's the kind of you know I would even say euphoria that. That I felt because they have the bleachers, they have thousands and thousands of people that, that are cheering you on, just as they would cheer on the elite athletes that have come in, you know, hours before you. And and so it's a, it's a really um, exciting and emotional uh, couple of minutes as you see the finish line um, and you're running along and you hang feel on, that. Hang on, Paul, you're not an emotional guy. 
You work in finance. Well, <laughs> your, your, your emotions, your emotions never get anywhere near the surface. Did, well, did they you, got, did they you got, actually feel emotional on Boston? Did you it, did you tear up you know, at the finish I, line? Well, I, I don't think I teared up, but uh, you know the emotions do definitely bubble up to the surface, and and you and you 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 know you lift your head after having maybe your eyes down for the last few miles, and then you look up and you see the finish line, and and you see the crowds, and you say this this is all worth it. And I would do it again. I would definitely like to do it again. Um, I, I had a second uh, race where I did a, 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 a Boston qualifying, but I, I didn't make the cut because it was, uh, um, I think I did the qualifying in 2016 and I, and, you know, for the 2018 race, um, but the, the buffer wasn't enough. Yeah, there were some very tough mm -hmm. years for qualifying. Yeah, and, and yeah. of course, since then, they've, they've tightened the qualifications by five minutes again. So uh, maybe when I get to the next stage bracket, I'll, I'll have some hope. What would you say to people who are um, maybe thinking about doing a big marathon, you know, one big marathon in the world? Would you, would you say Boston's one to target? Uh, I absolutely would. Um, I haven't done any uh, of the other marathon uh, world majors, but um, I think Boston is probably the most elite marathon in the world. It is accessible because as long as you can get a qualifying time, you can you can go. You know, you don't have to be an elite to, to run the Boston Marathon. Some of the support events, uh, for example, after the race, um, you know, you're invited to go to Fenway Park, for example, where a lot of people will go and congregate after the race to kind of celebrate. And it's a huge sense of accomplishment. So if anybody wants to celebrate um, their their running if they're if they're marathoners or, or even if they're not and want to have uh, a long-term goal it's definitely something that I would recommend that people try definitely gave me a, a huge sense of accomplishment after having completed the marathon, Boston Marathon and uh, I would definitely um, like to go back and and do it again hopefully one day. And it sounds also like you um, you would recommend to stay there sort of like that that day and not kind of leave to go home right after the marathon, because I think that's what I had done back when I did it. I didn't stick around and I, I've heard stories that, um, you know, the atmosphere is very nice. You, you know, you go and you eat somewhere and almost everybody in the restaurant has done Boston or had somebody that did Boston. So it seems to be like a nice, uh, nice atmosphere. Yeah, that's also something that I, I would recommend is that if you have the opportunity to do that, um, stay after the race, because that way you can take your time, you can enjoy the moment, you can share it with friends, hopefully, um, you don't have to rush off, and you're probably going to be in pain, so it also allows you to rest, you know, you don't have to squeeze into a car or, or, or a bus or a train or whatever it is uh, right after that. Um, it's, it's a moment to savor. And um, I think if you can if you can take that time, it's well worth it. Well, we hope you get to Boston again, uh, Paul, and uh, that the second time is even more savorable. Well, thanks very much. I know that um, uh, you, you know, Liz, you've done it once, Alan. You've done it uh, several times, and you've you've encountered all kinds of freaky weather conditions. Um, I was pretty lucky that when I did it, even though it was it was relatively warm, but that was you know relative to my training conditions. Um, I, I had a pretty good race day overall. Um, mm -hmm. So I will always remember that. I'm happy that I was able to do it. Uh, I owe a lot to uh, my my fellow runners and um, the running club because I wouldn't have got there without the people that, uh, that I run with. Props to Phoenix Running Club. Mm -hmm. And to all the running clubs out there. One of the runs in the Epic Runs book is uh, the Disney Marathon in Florida. And uh, when we saw the Disney Marathon, actually, the first person that we thought of was our running club friend, Linda. So we've got Linda here today, and she's going to tell us about her experience with this marathon. Linda, um, how about you tell us, first of all, how many times have you gone so far? To Disney, uh, I'm going to say 10 or 11 times. Oh, my God. We've been every year since my daughter was four. Uh, she's 15 now. And then last year, we actually ended up doing two trips. 
we went to Orlando when I did the marathon or actually I did the Goofy. And we also, when we went to Europe, we went to Paris, we ended up doing Disney for two days. Wow. What's this, you did the Goofy, what's the Goofy? So the Goofy is the marathon weekend, uh, which is in uh, January. I was one of the lucky ones, I guess last year that I got to do my marathon. So the Goofy is, you do the half marathon, which is the 21.1K, and then it's followed the next day by the full marathon, which is, is the 42.2K. Yeah, that does sound a little goofy. Jeez. <laughs> so it actually says that uh, the races start at 5.30 in the morning. So does that mean that both mornings you're waking up at probably, well, I don't even know what time Four you have to wake up. Something? Actually, I think the full marathon started at 5 a.m. So yeah, I guess 2.30? is when we woke up because you have to be there at least an hour to two hours ahead of time. We stayed on site and our hotel was maybe five minutes away. It was the Pop Century. It was about five minutes away from the start at Epcot Center. It starts from Epcot on both days. And I think it took us about an hour to get there by bus. So you actually run on the inside of the Disney Resort, like through the attractions? Yeah, you run through the attract, uh, attractions. But so you starts... need to buy a Disney ticket to get in? Not not for the... Uh, Otherwise, you no. could sneak off and just go on the Space Mountain or whatever? Or... <laughs> it's not open when you're running, unfortunately. Ah, okay. This is pro- probably part of the reason why it's so early in the morning. Oh, uh, yeah. It's very early. So the, uh, the half marathon runs through two of the parks. So it starts at Epcot. And then you run to um, Magic Kingdom. So it's about 10 kilometers. And it's still in the dark as you're getting to Magic Kingdom. And when you get into the park, the first thing you see is the castle. And because it's right after Christmas, all the decorations are still up. And so you see the, the castle lit up and it was breathtaking. It was like, wow, this is really nice. So you have thousands because the half marathon, I think, was 20,000 people. Wow. So everybody's coming through the park and then you see the castle and then they bring you towards the back and then you, uh, you obviously you leave the Magic Kingdom Park, but then you loop back around and then you end back at Epcot. And that was the uh, Saturday, which was the half marathon. So I would imagine you're super pumped because you get this uh, sort of Disney buzz when you when you start, like you say, with the, the big castle uh, lit up. Does that fade away? Does it sort of... Never, never fades away. The great thing about the start is each wave, they have fireworks. That's amazing. So, so you have the fireworks and then your wave starts. So you're already pumped because you're, you're in Disney. You're running the Disney Marathon. Yeah. Your fireworks are going off. Everybody's in costume. Most people are in costume, whether it's Princess or Minnie or Mickey or some size kind of Disney character. Come on then, what were, you, what were you dressed as? Well, for the half marathon, I was kind of like a daisy. I had the daisy colors. I had like the white skirt and the, the bandana and all that. <laughs> but for the full marathon, it was Minnie Mouse. I had a Minnie Mouse skirt and I had all the colors. Yeah. Cute. So how hard is it to get in? Like, do you need to qualify? Um, is there like a waiting list? Because I imagine Disney must be popular. You have to qualify but it, we're not talking a boston qualifier so you have to kind of you know prove that you can run the distance and there was when i registered there was like two starts it was below five and a half hours your finish time or over five and a half hours i'm not the fastest runner so my best time was four hours and 17 minutes i think and i was in like the third wave so I was towards the front for, for the start. Okay. So they want to make sure that you can run that distance, but it's not like out of reach. It's not out of reach, but I think the slowest time is probably in the seven hours for the full marathon. Yeah. So you've touched on some of the, 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 the sort of memorable stuff in terms of the start with fireworks, but what are the, what are the things that single out Disney as a special, special event? There's no pressure. It's, it's all for fun. As you're running along every X amount of kilometers, you're going to see a character. You're okay. not looking at your watch. Um, you don't care about your time. You see a character, you stop, you line up, you take a picture. Everybody's 
having fun. So you do your character you photographs on. while you're running the race. Exactly. Wow, that's fantastic. So that takes a, that takes your uh, your pressure right off, I guess. You're not worrying about your watch if you've got to wait in the line. Do people wait in the line and go, ooh, I don't know if I can wait this long to have my photograph taken with, uh, I don't know, Lilo or somebody. Then they, they kind of stress out and leave the line. Do you see no, people doing that? No, there's no stress. No. No, nobody, you don't care about your time. Okay. You, the, the lineup goes pretty quick. I mean, yeah. I stopped at almost every character and I finished in five and a half hours for the, oh, the, when I did the full marathon. And I stopped at almost every character. And is there a cutoff? Because I imagine there probably is. There is, but I don't know what it is. Okay, so I guess it's far enough from five and a half hours that uh, you don't need to care so much. So actually, you did the you did the goofy challenge, which is the half marathon, and then the full marathon. But in the book, they also mention the dopey challenge. Um, so that means that you're basically running four days, I think. That's how I understand it. Correct. The first day is a 5K, then there's a 10K the next day, the half marathon and the marathon. So um, w- would you attempt this in the future? Um, in the ne- very near future. So the next time that it opens up, I am going to do the dopey. I'm hoping, fingers crossed, that it will be 2022. But if not 2022, then whichever one is uh, allowing me to do it, 2023, I will be there to do the, uh, the dopey. Absolutely. Just hearing you talk about it's got me uh, suddenly thinking, oh, maybe I need to do this. It's a great time of year because there's not that much else going on in terms of the marathon running circuits uh, in North America. And it's just infectious hearing you talk about it and thinking, wow, that sounds like fun. It's a lot of fun. What tips would you give people who are thinking of doing it? Don't worry about your time. Worry about your distance. So as long as you can run two days, three days consecutive long distance ish you'll mm-hmm. be fine because you're going to stop yeah you can stop you're going to stop stop and pretend you're having your photograph taken with uh with mickey mouse uh just to get a rest exactly uh, when i was doing my training i was still doing my long runs on the saturday so i went up to i think 32k on sundays i would do the half the distance so okay. if i did the 30k on saturday the sunday i would do 15k a training tip as a training yeah that's actually a really good idea and then when when is the marathon and when do you have to register for it like let's say if there was one hypothetically in 2021 which there probably isn't there is one but it's virtual which i think starts it's next weekend actually and 2022 will be around the same dates which is the weekend after new year's Uh, registration i believe is in april oh wow okay so that opens pretty early. So you have to already think uh, in April about next year. I guess it's a reasonably reasonably expensive uh, visit because you've got to stay at maybe Disney resorts. It's not cheap. But I bet you. I bet you. You do. I do. <laughs> <laughs> See, when I went last year, I was going by myself, and then the week before we left, my daughter was looking at me with these sad eyes. So last minute, I said, "You can come with me." So it was her and I, uh, when I was running, she went to uh, Hollywood studios. She went at 6 AM because we were opening up at 7 AM. She stood in line to go do all the new star Wars uh, rides yeah. while I was oh. running. Yeah. Fun. So, so, so you can even, it's a good way to get to do, if you're a runner to get to do a marathon when you've got people that you're responsible for who are not interested in those kind of things exactly yeah would you uh, recommend that people stay on site or is there sort of like a way around that is there have you kind of done both or you've always sort of stayed in the resort so every time I've been to Disney I've stayed in the resort and for for me it 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 just makes more sense but you don't have to stay in the resort I've had friends who've stayed outside the resort um, but if you're going to do that, you have to make your own way into the uh, park and into the starting line. But okay. once if once you're on the resort, the buses, they come for you every 10 minutes, no, 10 minutes, not even 10 minutes when I'm talking about every five minutes, two minutes to get you to your start line. There was when I left my hotel room and I went down to get the bus, there was like already five or six buses lined up. They just pack you in, move, next bus comes along, so. It's like I'm adding another uh, run to my list of, bucket list of runs to do. First thing I'll have to do is think about what costume I'll have to go as. (laughs) It's so well organized, I recommend it. It was hot, 
So they were cautioning us because it was 23 degrees Celsius at 5 a.m. So wow. they wanted to make sure they were saying, this is not a day for a PB. <laughs> Perfect. Star Wars is Disney now, so maybe I could go as a Jedi. <laughs> yeah, that's it. <laughs> Absolutely. But you'd be be probably better off with a princess costume. You'd have more fun. (laughs) Well, that too. (laughs) Hashtag 2022 goals. (laughs) Well, um, I've been kind of pushing it. So there's a few of the, uh, hopefully the running buddies of mine. I won't mention any names, but the three or four I'm trying to get. So uh, Alan, Liz, join in. It'll be a great run. It'll be a lot of fun. No promises because we've got lots of these interviews to do. We'll get persuaded to do all of these runs of all of these people we're talking to. But it's definitely uh, worth thinking about. And it certainly sounds pretty infectious the way you describe it, Linda. It, it, it is. It's worth it. So our book, Epic Runs of the World, uh, is filled with all kinds of runs, short runs, uh, experience runs, exotic runs, trail runs, classic marathons that you've all heard about. There's one run in particular that um, we know one of our friends has, has done. It is, I think, one of the oldest ultra marathons in the world uh, called a Comrades Marathon in, in South Africa. Our friend Nestor, you may remember Nestor from our, our episode on North when uh, he told us about his uh, meeting with Scott Jurek during his Appalachian Trail effort. Nestor's not only good at the Appalachian Trail, but he's actually been and done the Comrades Marathon. Um, so Nestor, maybe you could tell us a bit about it. What prompted you to want to do this and, and why Comrades? Um, I guess Comrades was, um, my decision to run Comrades was happening when I was starting to do longer and longer runs, felt, you know, more confident about myself. And, um, you know, it's one of these races that you hear about, um, what do they call it? The greatest human race or something like that is the byline. Um, but I think what put me over the top was uh, a mutual running friend of ours, Anna Maria, um, did it back to back. So she did an up and a down and finished both, uh, you know, under the 12 hour cutoff. And I kind of, you know, she's like four foot nothing. And I thought if she can do it, well, it's, it's, uh, why not? Let's do it. It's, um, I had started doing marathons in different parts of the world. So I thought this was a great sort of destination place to go. I had never been to South Africa before. So um, it, it uh, compelled me for um, you know, a number of reasons. It's a bit of a misnomer because it, it's called the Comrades Marathon. And when we hear marathon, we think uh, 42.2K or 26.2 miles. But in fact, it's far, far, far longer than that. Yeah. Um, why they actually ended up calling it the marathon, it's a good question. I don't know. Um, the race varies a little bit year to year, but it's somewhere approaching 90K. It's usually around 89 something. Okay. So um, it's more than two, two full more marathons. Than two. Yeah. It's a two and then a painful six or something. Six <laughs> <day> after. <laughs> and it's interesting because it's um, every year they alternate. They run from uh, Durban on the coast inland. And uh, the town, in fact, escapes me the name. Um, and then the down, you start inland and you run towards the coast. Peter Marisberg. Yeah, we, we were hoping that you would say it because so, I wasn't sure I was pronouncing you to pronounce it right. It. <laughs> Some South Africans will write in and tell us we pronounced it wrong. We apologize. So it's a little more difficult when you're running up, or rather when you're running down, because everyone's kind of staying in Durban, the town that it starts in is kind of small. So they have to bus you out. So you start somewhere, you know, very, very early in the morning, like, I forget what it was. It had to have been like 3.30. And then they bust you that whole distance in. And then you, because the race starts just kind of around sunset, uh, sunrise, actually. And what would be the most memorable portion of the race? Um, geez, the most memorable part of the race probably was the second half. Because um, everything was kind of peachy keen. I had a, a target of running. I wasn't, you know, I was in pretty good shape. But I thought I'd run a 5.30 pace see what happens. I figured I could do that, a 5.30 marathon. That's like, you know, at that pace, that's nothing. But then I hit about 40K mark and I started to feel a little bit tired. And I said, this is way too early to be feeling just a little bit tired, Nesta. You're in better shape than this, or you thought you were. But somewhere past the marathon mark in the mid 40s, um, the uh, pace group came by me, caught me, and they called them the bus there. And um, the pace group, of course, had a, had a leader of the, of, of the pace group, of the bus. His name was Johan. I'll never forget that for as long as I live. 
And um, they came up on me and it was the, uh, the nine hour, the nine hour bus. And they have a uh, different medals for, for comrades. You have to finish in 12 hours or else you get nothing, zilch. Like you're one second over 12 hours, you get nothing. There's at least a medal for, I think there's one at 11. I know there's one for 10 and then there's one at nine. And, and even faster, there are others. And this bus was for the nine hours. And uh, I thought, if I don't get on this bus, like, I'm, I'm, I don't know if I'm going to finish. I was, I was feeling, you know, I'm halfway through and I'm feeling pretty bad. Mm -hmm. So I got on the bus and Johan, the bus driver, was f just relentless. He was incredible. Um, the group varied from 30, 50 people or so. He would yell at us. He would um, compliment us. He would, uh, tell, you know, whiplash us and did everything possible. And he kept saying, trust me, trust, I'm going to get you there. Just follow me. You have to trust me. And I ran with him and it hurt and it hurt like nuts. It was the toughest I had ever run. And uh, sure enough, he got us there three minutes uh, under nine hours. And at the end, we crossed the race. He, you know, he looked at me, came towards me and says, I'm proud of you. And he gave me the biggest hug. So wow. that was fun. It was, I had never run in a pace group. And, you know, here you're running in a pace group for 40 some odd kilometers together. You know, if, at, at some parts, it's like, you know, you're just barely hanging on. It's like the group is starting to slip away and you go, if, if I let them go another five meters, I'm cooked. I'm done. I'm sure you guys have been there. Mm -hmm. But um, he was great. He, was, he knew exactly what he was doing. And um, you know, hats off to him. Uh, apparently, this was about the seventh or eighth time he had been a bus driver at the Comrades. So he was experienced. And then coming in, the finish is kind of like a bit like Boston, maybe, or New York in the sense that the finish is huge. You come into the stadium, or at least you did then, and there's all these people and the crowds are roaring and, and um, it's just a great, a wonderful finish, wonderful experience. So would you do it again? I think so. I don't think I'd do it alone though. I was running alone. Okay. I traveled with my daughter who was at the time, Angie was probably 15 or 16 just to have a companion because I got there almost a week before the race started to Durban. I wanted to kind of unwind and acclimatize a little bit, although there's no altitude really involved. But um, yeah, I do it again, um, but I'd like to have a running partner uh, to do it. I think it's hard alone, it's hard. Mm -hmm. Did you have any moments during the run when you thought, this was a crazy idea, I need to, uh, I need to revisit why I'm here and uh, question yourself? Or were you just, I'm tired, but I'm, I'm going to finish? No, about 89 times I was questioning why I'm here. <laughs> <laughs> about every kilometer. It's good to hear. It's good I to hear. The, the first 20, you're very scenic. Um, mm -hmm. You know, yeah. South Africa, I'd never been to South Africa. So, I mean, it's well developed, nice paved roads. You're running through the countryside. There's a couple of spots where there are really nasty chicken farms, so it smells but um, it's very pretty. It's a nice rolling hillside. And did, they, did they have a big ceremony at the start, sort of to launch? You know, at Boston, they, they fire the jets over your head and they do play the national anthem. And... The start was, well, I mean, there was some, if I'm trying, trying to remember, there was a lot of noise. There were trumpets or something blowing, um, but it's not even daybreak yet. Huh? It's just, just, just the okay. light is starting in the sky, so it's, it's early. I remember just kind of scrambling. Oh my God, we're starting type of thing. Do you remember, um, was it hard to get in? Like, did you need to qualify or show proof that you've run a marathon before or anything like that? Well, it's an interesting question. Um, they do go about it a little bit differently. Um, for anyone who's run a marathon in Europe, I think you'll know what I mean. And South Africa was kind of like that uh, and even more so is that you sort of, you, you have to send them like a testament from your doctor saying that they think that you're in good enough shape. <laughs> um, yes, you have to show that you've run something before. So it's almost old school, you know, it's not um, very analytical. Um, they kind of just want to have enough confidence that you know what you're doing um, and that you're not going to die on them type okay. of thing. But there's no, there's no time trial. You have, you know, there's no preset time. You have to have run any sort of race. Okay. And so how, how hard was it to get that, um, that medical clearance? Because I oh, know like... Not, not hard at all. Oh, okay. Yeah. So it's, it's a form. You bring it to the doctor. It says, is this person fit enough to run 96 kilometers? Your doctor thinks you're nuts, but he signs it anyway. Or how does that work? Yeah. I mean, you know, as, as long as you don't bring it to your psychiatrist and just to your doctor, <laughs> who's not qualified to make a judgment on your sanity, 
um, you're in, you're pretty good. So in that sense, the race is very accessible to people. Although, you know, certainly we would, you know, qualify it as an elite kind of race in terms of where it stands in the ratings in mm -hmm. the world. Um, it is very accessible. I don't know what the cap is on the numbers, but it's quite large. Um, they do take a large field. So I think for anyone who is interested in expanding their distances and, and their horizons and, and even geography, um, it is a long way to go, but it is accessible. You know, it's not like a, a Berlin is harder to get into, for example, or a New York or a Boston, which is getting increasingly harder. This is fun. I hear that it changes direction as well, which is quite unusual for, for a race. Year to year, you mean? Yeah, each year. Yep. Yeah, so there's an up and there's a down. So, and I forget what it's called, but you're a true comrade marathoner if you've done both the up and the down. Okay. Just as Anna Maria. Or Crazy Ray. lunatic, I think they call it. Crazy lunatic. <laughs> um, but they do have an interesting thing as well. The day before, um, you can sign up on a bus tour of the uh, uh, of of the uh, of the track of of the uh, route, if you will. Okay. Um, and part of the bus tour is you stop, and they do this every year, apparently. They stop at a school for which comrades, part of the proceeds, go towards supporting this school. And it's a school primarily of elementary kids. I don't think there were anyone, you know, there were maybe up to the mid-teens. But they do songs, you know, so we all get off the bus, and we stand, and the school kids are all there in the uniforms. They do some songs, they do some dancing, and then you can take pictures. It's actually really, really um, nicely done. And a lot of the kids were really, really excited. You know, they ask where you're from, you know. So they're seeing, you know, they haven't probably left South Africa in their lives. And they're seeing people from Europe, from Asia. From it gets kind of a social geography lesson at the same time. You Absolutely. get an experience. Absolutely. That's pretty neat. It is. Very, very nice. It's, it's very well organized. Um, you know, no negatives at all. Uh, they even give you beer at the end, if you want, of the race. It's probably a compulsory factor for you, Nesta. Interestingly enough, though, um, you know, I drank half the beer and then I had to lie down for half an hour. Because <laughs> I thought I was going to, my daughter looked at me and yeah. said, Dad, you're looking a little green. Yeah. <laughs> kind of like you after one of those Bostons, Alan, if you remember. Yes, I remember it well. <laughs> <laughs> In fact, we have a photograph and I'm standing in between you and Pete and uh, it looks like I've got my arms draped over you in a friendly manner. But in fact, the only reason I've got my arms draped over is that if I didn't, I would fall down. <laughs> but honestly, I mean, I know you're editing this audio, but um, if either one of you ever wanted to do comrades again, I'm, uh, I'm in. Oh. Okay, so we've got standing invites now. Oh, I could be tempted to say yes. It's just a long way to go. You don't realize, I mean, you know, flying to London, fine, five, six hours, but then you've got 10 or 11 hours due south all the way to, um, I guess it was Johannesburg where we landed. It's a long way. Oh, wow. And I had never flown south like that. You're, you're flying for 11 hours, but the time zone's the same. Did you find it to be friendly? Very friendly. Um, absolutely. People are lining the course. Now, lining the course obviously varies, kind of like Boston in the sense that there's a lot, a lot of rural running. For many, many kilometers, there's no yeah. one, but every village there are people. Um, and as you get closer and closer into town, um, it gets uh, louder and louder. So, yeah, I mean, very friendly. Absolutely. The race seems to have a reputation for being um, a multicultural event way, way before and a multiracial event way, way before the apartheid uh, regimes were broken. Yes, um, yes. And also to having females in way, way before they were allowed in Boston, for example. I mean, I don't know uh, the history of the race uh, perfectly well, but my understanding is the name of it comes from a bunch of veterans of World War I who essentially wanted to commemorate their fallen comrades um, in some way. And I guess somebody um, had the crazy idea, let's run this race. Um, and yeah. that's how it's, and that's why it's called Comrade. Yeah, the book tells us that it's been in existence since 1921, so that fits well with World War One. Yeah, exactly. Well, thanks for telling us about your experience, Nestor. Uh, looks like we, you know, we're going to have to start paying you a retainer because ah. you seem to be a, <laughs> seem to be appearing on our podcast at regular intervals. Well, I'm going to have to pick more interesting races moving forward, so I stay on the A list. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Pretty soon we won't be able to get you on. You'll be invited, you know, to be on uh, late night talk shows and 
those oh, kinds of things. Oh, you'll be able to know. get me. The question is, will you be able to, to afford, afford you? <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, great. Okay, well, I hope that you guys all enjoyed the little interviews that we did with our running friends about the epic races that they've done. The book is full of epic races. I mean, it's quite a quite a big book. So uh, if you want to look at uh, what else it contains, you can get a copy for yourself. The book is uh, also a good gift idea for people. Uh, it doesn't have to necessarily be a runner that likes reading. You can um, get it for, for any runner. That's actually how I ended up with my book. Um, I got it as a gift for Christmas. Yeah, exactly. That's how I found out about the book was because Alan got it for Christmas. <laughs> we'll just uh, maybe give you our opinions uh, about the book uh, just in general. So Alan, do you want to start with that? Uh, sure. Well, it's a, it's a great coffee table book. You know, something that you can have lying around all the time. People are interested to pick it up and look at it. And of course... That means every so often you can pick it up and just dip in and get excited, um, which is kind of how I use it. I've had it lying around. You know, I'm waiting for my TV program to come on and go, oh, I just pick the book up and have a look at uh, Vietnam running or, you know, some, some mountain or whatever. Sometimes it even reminds you of a run that you did that isn't even in the book. So if you've had some sort of epic experience in the mountains and you see some mountains and you go, I remember when I did X. Like Trans Selkirk's. Yes, Trans Selkirk's Run, for example, is a fantastic uh, experience. And there are a lot of similar, but not exactly that in, in the book. About half of the book is, is sort of beautiful color photographs uh, and little maps of courses, which give you the real flavor of the run while you're reading the short reports. So the run reports are not, you know, extensive, extensive. It's just to give you a taste, really. And also the, the, the runs are all epic in terms of super interesting in some way, uh, awesome in some way, but not necessarily in difficulty. Some of them are extremely difficult, but some of them, the difficulty is not that huge. I mean, for example, there's actually um, a small section referring to where we live, Montreal, and uh, the Mont, Mount Royal Park there which is super fun to, to run in, but you know, anyone could do it. Any runner could do it uh, any time, really. We do it regularly along with lots of other people. Although I suppose in the middle of winter with the snow, it's pretty epic. It is kind of epic. So, you know, that's, you know, my feelings about the book. What about yourself, Liz? Um, I thought that it was nicely put together. I love the hard cover and the thick pages. Um, the thickness of the pages is, is it's really, it, adds, <laughs> it, just, it adds to the experience. I don't know, for me, like there's something about turning the pages of a book and a book like this, where the, the paper is really thick and kind of glossy. I don't know, it just, it just makes everything look more epic. I hope the publishers are all listening and they publish their books with, <laughs> with thick enough pages. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I don't know. I, for me, that, that's part of the experience is the thick, glossy pages with the pictures, some of them like full page pictures. Um, I think it's amazing. It's a bit more like a magazine in that way. Yeah, it's nice to have for most passionate runners that are always looking for their new adventure. It's got something for everyone. So that's something I liked. I mean, it, it, it can pretty much appeal to, uh, to any runner because it's got... Uh, you don't need to necessarily do a race. It's got runs, uh, like you described, uh, Mount Royal, which is not, it's not a race. Like anyone can visit Montreal, go to Mount Royal and run. And uh, the same thing, they have um, Vancouver's Seawall, which apparently is a place in Vancouver where uh, it's sort of like a road, wide, like a road, but there's no traffic. And apparently it's sort of like a track for the local running community and they go there to do workouts and stuff and it's the same thing anyone can just you know you can be visiting Vancouver and say I want to go for a run and you go run on the seawall it's got iconic road races like the Boston Marathon but it's also got trail runs it's got ultra races like uh, Marathon des Sables and uh, Comrades Marathon and it also has uh, the crazy races like Barkley Marathon uh, which prides itself for the least number of finishers. So I really thought that the book had, uh, it has something for everyone. 
and you'll have sort of a few of the 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 races that are that everybody's heard of like Boston but you'll always have some you be able to pick out some that you've never heard of so it'll just sort of open your eyes to how many different uh, different runs there are out there so I thought it was thought it was a great book so in summary it's an excellent gift for the runner in your life exactly so thank you for listening to another episode of running book reviews a little bit different today a big thank you to the publisher lonely planet for providing us with a review copy of of the book epic runs in the world if you'd like to leave us some feedback about how we can improve the podcast or you just want to talk to us suggest a book that we'd like to review please leave a comment in any so any of the social media or our platforms We are running book reviews on Facebook and Instagram. And on Twitter, we are reviews underscore running. Please also follow us on social media to find out about new episodes when they're released. Or you can just subscribe to the podcast on your favorite streaming platform. And that's goodbye from us for another episode of Running Book Reviews. Thanks for listening.